But when you are working a serial killer case, you feel the responsibility that if you don't stop this person, other people might die. It's a huge responsibility. That is it, individually, you, you, you kind of take on board. The media won't let you forget it. He looked me right in the eye and he said, so despite everything I've done, you, you, you'd still help me, you'd still... And I said, yeah, yeah, I want to help you. Dave Leach, welcome to I Catch Killers. Thank you. It's lovely it's, to be here. Well, it's a, it's strange that we've got you here. We probably should explain how I've managed to catch a uh, recently ch- retired Scotland Yard detective and how we've managed to get you in the studio. You're, in fact, over here from the UK on uh, holidays. And uh, yeah. one of my sources, without giving up names, Charlie Bazzini, <laughs> a uh, well-known uh, retired homicide detective from uh, Victoria, yeah. happened to mention you were in Sydney. And then uh, we pulled our resources together and we managed to find you on Bondi Beach, <laughs> which is not hard for a British tourist. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so no, that's fine. exactly right. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks, uh, thanks for coming on. And uh, I, we've spoken a bit now before the podcast and uh, mm. your career has been fascinating. So 40 years, uh, basically, or almost 40 years in the, yeah. in the place. Yeah, yeah, certainly uh, 35 and a little bit of a break to New Zealand as well, yeah. But that counts. In, that counts. We're yeah, in Australia. The policing in New Zealand still <laughs> still counts. But uh, you only uh, retired last year. Yeah, June just gone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how how does it feel after a, a, such a lengthy career as a uh, as a police officer? Ah, uh, do you know? I didn't think it was going to affect me at all leading up to it. I was quite convinced I'd be quite happy. Um, but it has been quite tough to be fair. First two or three months, if uh, you, know, you feel a bit lost, you know. Yeah. Because you, it's almost like I'm institutionalised. I, uh, I was born in London, grew up in London, but then used to commute in thereafter in recent times. So you get used to getting up at a certain time, getting on the train, getting in the office, living and breathing the job, some long days, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden, bam, nothing. Yeah, it's a it's a real extreme cutoff, isn't it, from, yeah. the, from the pressure where you, you're always looking at your phone, never knowing where you're going to be heading or yeah. what you're going to be doing to all of a sudden you can leave the phone at home if you wanted to. Yeah, it's quite brutal, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just getting round. It's coming round now. You know, I'm starting to enjoy it a lot more. Yeah. Did you find when you heard, heard a crime, and I, I think a lot of police are uh, this way inclined, that uh, especially uh, detectives, when you hear of a crime happen, you think, oh, I'm, you're watching it play out in the media, and yeah. you're thinking, I wonder what they're doing there, or I wish I was looking at that one. That would be an interesting one. You, 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 you do, you do. Um, th- that bit. You do miss, and you you take an interest in, and you kind of wish you was part of it. Yeah, yeah. I let go of that. Well, I've I've been out of the police now for uh, three years, and uh, I the longer you stay out, the more distant you feel from it. But you still yeah. have that inclination where I, I see, and you know, I, I specialised in as a homicide detective. So you see a murder, and you think, okay, mm-hmm. that'd be an interesting uh, interesting case to uh, to work on. Yeah. Normally on this uh, this show, we get a sense of why you've joined the police and a bit about your uh, your career. I just want to flip it a little bit here because okay. there's one particular case uh, I've been talking to you about and uh, I, I've mentioned it to people and uh, it resonates with people. It was a fairly high profile case and that was uh, the serial killer, Levi Belfield, um, yeah. around 2008. You worked on that case. Do you want to tell us uh, all the full circumstances of that particular case? Yeah. Yeah. Um- I was um, to be to be fair. I was tied up for a while, which another case that we'll probably touch on. But um, I was drawn into the Belfield case. Um, now to go to go back to what he did. Basically, uh, he was a, a car clamper, stroke bouncer, just a, a really uncouth, nasty man who used to bully local girls, young girls. Yeah, and plied them with drugs and money and stuff like that for for basically sexual purposes. Yep. And then um, for reasons best known to himself, we now know with hindsight that he started to prey on, um, I mean, the girl that he murdered was called Amélie de Lagrange, which was a French girl who was on holiday, stroke working, student visa holiday. Yeah. Um, and she was making her way home one particular night. He was in his car clamping van. And when just, you say car clamping, just to explain for our Australian listeners, mm, what, uh, you're talking about uh, like recovery, debt yeah. recovery, that type of... No, worse than that. In a way, we had this period in England and certainly in London where you get these bullies, basically. You used to go around working for uh, 
terms. Hey, that, there was these little car parks based there and there amongst residential and business premises. And they decided that they could um, start selling off some of those car spaces for, for money. And if you parked there illegally, which people did, right. then these guys would come in and clamp your car. There'd be signs up saying yeah. if you get clamped. But they were up to all sorts of, you know, and he was a, he was a bouncer as well. So what he would do is effectively clamp the car turn up so you have to pay us 150 quid yeah. or that clamp stays on bit uh, of organized extortion yeah, yeah yeah that in the end got got licensed and and they basically got driven drove out of business but but during that period that's what he was doing okay so uh, getting back to uh this uh, mm. the first first victim so she was walking across uh twickenham green on her way home and he attacked her from behind with something, presumably a hammer, something or, or, or something as equally as heavy or, or heavier from behind mm. and basically murdered her there and then. Um, probably, and he's never admitted it, you know, as to why or given us any more detail, was that he got in conversation with her. Right. Possibly she was the type of girl that would have ignored him, refused him, kept walking. He wasn't used to that. He's yeah. a bully where he lived. The girls listened to him. They were younger girls. He could get his own way, but he, um, he, he hit her over the head and, and then just made his way off. Right. Um, that's a pretty uh, random. Yeah. And uh, they are quite difficult to solve sometimes, just the random nature of that. It was extremely, extremely difficult. Um, and you know we had a bit of luck and a bit of good work and and we 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 obviously did in the end which i can yeah explain um but he was responsible for um for other murders as well that we found out afterwards um the millie dowler one i'll come to but that was slightly different yeah but there was another girl whose name off the top of my head now um oh marsha marsha mcdonald yep she lived in hampton which was literally 10 minutes in the car from Twickenham Green where Amelie got murdered and another girl where he, he basically down in a uh, little, little bit further away but he ran her over in his car deliberately. That was uh, Kate Sheedy? Kate Sheedy. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. you, you've got uh, two girls that have been murdered yep. at this stage and a third one that's uh, he tried to or he ran her over so an attempt to murder. Yeah. Yeah, um, but we picked it up. Another team dealt with a Marsha McDonald murder. Right. She was hit, but they they concluded with a hammer. Again, completely randomly. Yep, that was unsolved when we picked up this one. Okay, um, and uh, my involvement came so that there was a white van picked up on CCTV. Yep, typically. for which which murder for this for, one? for, for the Emily one. Okay, yeah. yep. Typically blurred, typical kind of part of it was bus CCTV, yeah, um, and part of it was premises as he drove by. Okay, so so a lot of work was spent on white vans, um, registration numbers. Yeah, I think there was a little partial potential registration number, but it was really quite poor. Um, so a lot of time was spent, and I, I initially wasn't on the inquiry. I was ticking over on another homicide investigation and my brother curiously uh, worked on the same murder team as me and he uh, he approached me and said um, there's an unresolved action involving a car dealership so what they were doing is they were tracking down every white van and speaking to the owner and finding out when and if they still had the car, if they'd sold it, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be a long, drawn-out inquiry. Yeah, we, we, we've had similar inquiries over here where you've got the partial plates or a make type and you're virtually going around speaking yeah. to all the registered owners. So is that what you were doing or yeah. that's what you, yeah. the team were doing at, at that stage? Yeah. And, and there was another bit of evidence which was interesting, which coincided with the van, which was that her phone, her handbag was stolen mm -hmm. and her phone was tracked after the event to... Uh, Walton on Thames, which is probably 25 minutes to half an hour drive away. And um, it was thrown into the river and it was recovered from the river. Right. Um, so that was the last time. So it, it didn't really lead to much. Yeah. What led to his arrest was effectively the, the van. And so we had this uh, this action where a police officer, and he, you know, there were so many actions. He rang up a car dealership and spoke to a guy called John, who I knew personally. 
And he's he's asked John about the van. He's 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 given him a few clues about the van. And John with, afterwards told me that he wasn't sure who this guy was. And yeah. he even said to the, the the officer, "Look, you know, I don't know who you are. You know, can I ring you back?" And the officer was. The, the inquiry was huge. And it's understandable that he said, listen, I'm in a police station that I'm just guesting at. I don't, I haven't got the number as part of it, you know. Cause so uh, the police have made an inquiry about yeah. this van and yeah. fa- phoned up, this is a registered owner, phoned up and said, do you own a van? Did you sell it? Yeah. Oh, did you sell the van? Because you're okay. a dealership. Yep. And it was all a bit complicated. So John said, he just shut down and went, I'm sorry, mate, I can't help you. Yeah. So it was kind of left kind of open. So my brother had seen this action that And needed- when, when you say action, and just for the, the mm. terminology, that we would call it in New South Wales like a tasking, uh, a, yeah. a, an investigation task that you're, you're referring to an action is yeah. an outstanding line of inquiry. Exactly yeah. that. And, and the computer system we use, which is probably similar to yours, needs to be, it needs to be resolved so that it can be shut down before it, it, it tries to take out any human error. Yeah. You know, it tries to take out that human bit where you forget that you haven't done that thing or something like that. So it, it spits it out, overdue action. Yeah. Yeah. What's so happened it, here? And it spat it out. My brother's got hold of it. And he's then said to me, can you speak to your mate John and see if you can get a bit more info here? So I went to see John and said, listen, you know, this van, uh, could you describe it to me? And, and, and he started describing a van where it had two metal plates on the back, welded on the back doors. It had a little red light on the top, and it was an airport van, one of those that runs around the perimeter road. Ah, yes. Yeah, yep. And he mentioned this guy. um, It wasn't Levi that he mentioned. It was another guy called Aaron Smith, and Aaron Smith was a traveller, gypsy-type character who John knew well and bought vans from him regularly. But he was aware, John, that Aaron had bought the van off him, but he'd given it or sold it to this guy called Levi. Okay. So in my mind, I'd seen the CCTV footage, as you would do before you went and saw a, a potential witness, and I was aware of this blurred bits on the back of the on the back of the doors. And then he mentioned the plates on the back of the doors and the little light on the top. It fitted with the van that I'd seen on the CCTV. Right. Then he mentioned this guy, Le- Levi Belfield, and then he started to tell me about Belfield, similar to what I just told you earlier about... You know, he was into young girls and he was a bully and, you know, bouncer, car clamper. Yeah. And the penny just dropped at that point. And, you know, I contacted my brother and Mark in the in the uh, back at base and said that, you know, this, and this is who he is. We need to get on to this, start researching who he is. And with immediate effect, that's exactly what happened. And then literally a few days later... Um, Colin Sutton, who was the he was the detective chief inspector, yeah, who was in, who was leading the inquiry. So I kind of basically took another back foot because I was so so deep into the other homicide I was doing that I just assumed that that was my involvement. He contacted me and said, "Look, I want you to arrest and interview Belfield," which was nice to hear and a bit yeah. of an honour, to be honest. Yeah, that's what. I did a lot of, and that's what I think I was good at. But I felt a little bit awkward because the rest of the team had been working on this inquiry, and then I get drawn into it. To make the arrest. Yeah, and I thought, well, it's just a bit awkward. I said, I said, said that to Colin Sutton. I mean, he puts it in his book, and he said to me, no, look, listen, don't worry about what the team think. I want the best people to do these jobs, and that, that's what you're good at. That's what I want you to do. And, and I was uh, like, fine. What was your boss's name? Colin Sutton. Well, good on him because I, I think they, they're the brave mm. decisions that have to be made sometimes in investigations like yeah. this. Yeah, and, and others along the way haven't made those brave decisions. They tend to go along the lines of, you know, well, it's not your turn this time, it's someone else's yeah, turn, you don't and that give, doesn't work. It's not turns, it's the right person for the right task. Mm. Okay, so you've been given this, at this point in time, you've got yeah. he's got access to a car. Yeah. He fits the type of profile of the person you're looking for. Yeah. But that's pretty much all, all you've got at this stage. Is Have you got any forensic evidence yeah, linking no, him to the crime? No, no. It was all um, it was all about the vehicle, really, at that yeah. stage. And um, there was other stuff. The vehicle was extended then to other cameras and AMPR cameras um, and motorway cameras, and it picked him up in the driver's seat so we could then put him in the car. 
Okay. So that's a good starting point if you're going to interview someone. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And um, eventually, um, I interviewed him over two or three days to begin with. I mean, he, just, he didn't say anything. Right. T- tell us about that because I think people would be interested in it. So you've got this line of inquiry. You, have you got authority to arrest him and, and detain him on yeah. the information you had at that point in time? A- absolutely. I mean, in, in England, it's just reasonable cause to suspect and we had reasonable cause to suspect. So yep. he was arrested. His house was searched. I mean, we found him in the loft, curiously. He was hidden up there, wrapped up in the old rock wall, you know, the edgy stuff. Yeah. Wrapped himself up in that. So when you when you knocked on the door... And uh, yeah. he didn't answer you, announced your office or gained entry into the premises and you found him hiding up in the uh, insert wall. Yeah, yeah. I mean, his, his, his girlfriend, his, his abused girlfriend that he'd abused over the years physically and mentally uh, was pointing upwards. <laughs> right, okay. The whole house was being searched. It's interesting. Pointing upwards. Tell, tells a story. <laughs> tells a story. How, yeah. how did you feel at, at that point in time? Did you think you had your man? Because- yeah, um, yeah. Well, I, was, I, I, I personally was convinced we had that we had the right man, and yeah. uh, a lot of work was done thereafter. To you know, with witnesses and other witnesses yeah. came forward, and even so-called allies of his started talking to police thereafter. But so with the arrest, with reasonable cause, mm. you've you've taken him back to the police station, enter him into custody. That's right. Um, his rights are provided to him, I, I would imagine. I've, I've done some work over in London, so I've got yeah. that's not dissimilar to mm. what uh, what we've got here. You're allowed to detain him for... Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we've got the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, yep. which dictates that after a period of time, you have to after, ask for extension. So you yep. go 24 hours, then you'd ask for extension, extension for a couple of days, okay. and then that can go longer depending on the circumstances. Yeah. So he would have been kept in for a week, um, and, and then you've got to decide whether you're going to charge or bail. Okay. That's uh, a lot longer than uh, we, we have the option over here. You put him in the interview room, and you start yeah. putting stuff to him. What sort of response are you getting from him? He took the approach originally of of just no comment, no comment. Um, it, I have to say that outside of the interview room, trying to rebuild a, build a rapport and a relationship with him, I actually got on really well with him. Yeah, people, that might surprise people. I I I've always had that kind of ability not to, not to let let anything you know like his reputation or whatever influence me. Um, yeah. I don't judge him, and at that stage, I'm just trying to build a rapport and we got yeah. on really well so when it came to the interview then uh, then he flipped into the usual which suspects quite often do he, he actually went one stage further turned his chair and faced the wall when you were talking to him when we were talking to him yeah uh, my uh, the guy who was interviewing him with me Gary Cunningham uh we both spent a lot of time putting questions to him and ah, just trying to provoke him into, you know, into making responses in various ways. But he, he just literally shut you down, just shut us down and just made no comment, no comment. I mean, three days into the interviewing, yeah, I, I mean, it's ironic, I had to leave the interviews to come to Australia. <laughs> right. Which okay. is ironic when you yeah. think about it. But, but I think by then, probably we were. We were accepting that a change of interview team might work, so that's not uncommon. Yeah, something uh, fresh coming in. You spent that time sitting in the interview room with uh, Belfield, and you said, yeah, you were getting on. Given the type of crimes that you suspected of him um, committing, how did you feel like even communicating with a person like that? Do you know that that's an interesting question, and I've always, always throughout my career had the ability, and I can think of another one when I was shown into a cell once and threw my arm around this character because he was a bit upset, and he went on to confess that he'd he'd committed a murder in Scotland and that he'd 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 chopped their fingers off, set fire to them and set in, and all these things that and he was arrested for burglary and and, and what what made him do that hmm. was me just being nice to him, yeah. I didn't, and I, I didn't have to. I'm beginning to worry about myself here, as I say it. Um, but I didn't have to form that intent or write any notes to do that. It was just an instinctive feeling. So yeah. it was the same with Belfield when I was trying to build a rapport. I was genuinely 
trying to understand, yeah. genuinely curious about what made this guy behave the way he did. And I, I had no problem at all yeah. with getting on with him. I, I walk the same path. I, I've gone on with horrendous murderers, gone into an interview room and sat down, shook their hand, and then have a have a conversation with them. Mm. I think it carries something. You've got to get to know who the person is. There's no point putting in, walking in as a big tough cop. Here, I know you've done yeah. this and, and shutting down. Then that gets that barrier. I ask this question um, following on from that because I've found this uh, how I walk out. Sometimes I walk out after that when all the charging's finished and everything and you, you go home, you feel dirty. Yeah. That you've, you've spent, you know, yeah. You build a rapport with someone. If you spend long enough in an interview room with them, you build a rapport whether you like it or not. And yeah. sometimes I feel like I walk away and I take a little bit of that yuckiness away with me. Yeah, you do get a bit of that. But at the time when, in, when you're in the moment, you, you can't help yourself. It, yeah. It's it's a strange thing. And I've always been like it. I, I would have relationships wherever I go. I'd have a relationship with a girl down at the coffee shop. Yeah. All of a sudden, I'll just say, hello, how are you? And we'll have a chat. And I, I've i always been that way. I, I People, I love people. Yeah. I'm interested in people. And when I, I've got one as part of my job that I've got an opportunity to explore and, and find out a little bit about them, what goes on in their head and why they've done this, I have no problem at all. Yeah. And uh, another, the other big murder that brought me to Australia, he was another one who confessed to murder and took me to the body. Yeah. Now, that, that, that's highly unusual. I didn't trick him. Yeah. I, had, I, I didn't – I don't trick them. I'm just nice. Yeah. But not nice, smarmy nice. I'm genuinely nice because I'm I'm genuinely curious because Do, people often I understand because people often say what happens in that interview room like what mm. did you do a lot of times they want to unburden themselves ah, that's exactly what it is and you know, you, you have provide, to find you that. provide the conduit for them to unburden themselves and yeah. and that's and you can see the weight lift off their shoulders you you give them a you give them that opportunity that exit door that reason to put their hands up if you yeah. pin them down it's like human nature you pin them down to the point of pointing your fingers shouting at them and all that you'll never get anywhere if you give them a reason or a, a little route to say listen i'm really sorry i want to explain it this is let them go there yeah uh, and, and 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 that's all i've ever done and it's it's always worked. It's always been successful, and it worked from the beginning, and it still works today. I'm interested in that that process, keeping him there for that long. He gets to sleep. You have to let him sleep, and, yeah. eat, and so it's not sort of kept up for three days, but it, it's intense. He'd be feeding you a little bit of information. You'd be cross referencing that and having mm. teams out following up actions over there to yeah. corroborate the information you've got. At what point in time did you you think? Like I know you you thought at the start. You've got the right person. Yeah. When did you think you were going to get it across the line as in we will be able to charge this person? Was that when you were interviewing them or did that come after? No, that came much later. You know, yeah. I um, uh, I, had, I wasn't actually there when those decisions were made with the Belfield one. Um I was I was over here yeah. in Sydney. Um, that was that was. We'll, we'll talk on that later. Yeah, that was following sure. up another uh, murder inquiry over. Yeah, yep. And 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 then the, the inquiries um, and and the um, the evidence to uh, to make sure that he was um, convicted was long and drawn out yeah. over eighteen months. Was was he released after this point in time, or was he charged? No, he went. He was charged and went in custody. You see, there was other offences that came into being. Yep. That we could prove. Yeah. Particularly in relation to the girlfriend. So once he was safely locked up and with us, she then opened up about the um, the Domestic abuse that she abuse. was. Yeah. So he was effectively charged with those offences, yep. which held him in custody. Okay. So he wasn't charged with this offence. And then that was built on over a long, long period. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it, it, it was fortunate from our point of view that there are these, these other mo relatively minor offences in relation to approaching young girls and, and you know, all those sorts of offences which aren't minor, but in relation to the homicide were enough to keep him in custody. Okay. And at what? so this is still looking at just him for one murder at this point in time? Yeah. Uh, had, had the other ones been linked? Well, there was another unsolved crime which was huge in the UK to do with a girl called Millie Dowler. That was a 13-year-old? Yeah. yeah. She, she was last seen coming out of the station at Walton-on-Thames where she just mysteriously disappeared. And uh, 
we, the girlfriend of of uh, Belfield, um, she started telling us things about that she suspected he was uh, guilty of the murder of Millie Dowler, and uh, from memory, see what what happened was, although they lived in West Drayton, which is near Heathrow Airport, yeah, because of the abuse that she had been facing, she was given another premises in Walton on Thames. How far away are we talking? Well, from West Drayton, quite quite you know, 25 minutes, half an hour drive. Okay. But interestingly, the premises was just over the road from Wharton on Thames tra- train station. And that's where the young girl? A, a ground floor flat right. where the young girl um, was walked. She would have walked past that way on her way home. And that's where the the girlfriend was given this premises. Okay. But you know what it's like with domestic abuse? Um, quite often... Um, the other, the, you know, the, the the villain of the piece is able to persuade normally his his female partner that you know he's changed and let's give it another go and you know and so she allows him to come back in her life. Yeah, so it's come, t- time and time yeah. again over here. Yep, and of course that's what happened. So what happened was she was living in Morton on Thames, but at some stage back in you know months weeks before. He'd got back into her life, and he used to frequent that that so flat. So he ended up in the the yeah, flat where yeah. near where the young girl disappeared from. Now, what what we were curious about was so so she, she said a few things, and one was that on the night that Millie Dowler went missing, he wasn't at home, and that uh, she'd spoken to him about where he was, and yeah. he said he he was in Morton on Thames. He couldn't sleep, and he went over there, and he just wanted to get his head down, and he went over. So it there. puts him in the vicinity. Puts him there, and he had a particular dog. He had a little dog, uh, like a bull terrier, Staffordshire bull terrier dog. Yeah. And that it, there was a sighting by a witness that saw a guy fitting the, the description of Belfield walking the streets of Walton on Thames that okay. night. And how the time frame? We've mm. got the uh, two uh, murders of. Uh, Marsha McDonald and mm. Amelia Delgrange, yeah. and then the attempt on Kate Sheedy, mm. and then we got Millie Dowler, the thirteen-year-old. Yeah, time period between all oh, these probably, offences. Oh, I think the the Millie Dowler one was about a year or so before. I can't be be sure now after okay. all these years, but yeah, about a year or so. You know, some considerable time before. Yeah, the Marsha McDonald one wasn't. That was a matter of months before. Yeah, um, and the Kate Sheedy one was 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 probably about a year. 18 months. The Sheedy one came before the Marshall McDonald one. Okay. Where that fits with Dowler, I'm not sure. But so you've got these two pieces of evidence, and then you had this red car. Red. He had a red Daewoo. And on the CCTV footage that Surrey had, Surrey Police, because it was in Surrey yeah. Police's ground and we were the Metropolitan Police. So um, they had a red car seen on CCTV for an opposite building driving off at a certain time on the night that that Millie Dowler went missing. Well, that fitted with the red daywoo that that, that uh, Belfield had. Yeah. Conveniently, the girlfriend of Belfield said that that car was never seen again, and he had told her that that car uh, was stolen. Okay. That's starting to get very interesting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. But it wasn't stolen. It just disappeared, and it was later proven that he'd, he'd taken it to a scrapyard and got yeah. rid of it. Okay. And had had the, the, you said Surrey and yeah. uh, your the the Metro place where yeah. you're working, yeah. had you guys made the connection between the uh, the two? Because the weight of that evidence, like mm. he's a bloke that's got access to uh, a white car, a red car, and those cars have been seen in the vicinity of where two females yeah. have disappeared from. I think it's fair to say now. I mean, we we were at the time we were convinced we had ourselves a serial killer who was responsible for. One, two, three murders. Okay. But the problem is that Colin Sutton, I mean, he details this at length in his book and on television that he discussed all this with Surrey Police. But Surrey Police had their own their own suspects at the time. Yeah. It's easy for us. We we felt strongly that this is your man. Um, there was another thing that, that 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 worried us was that you know when you do you do this over here where you do house to house inquiries. Yeah, canvassing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you do a house-to-house inquiry, you will knock at any given door and you will say, well, you know, would you mind telling me who you are and who lives here? Yep. Okay. And then you'd say, well, who lives next door? 
Yeah. And uh, then you go the other side and it would all match up. So, you, you know, you, and then you would complete those house to house inquiries once you knew everybody who was there through that period. I, I don't think they were done completely by Surrey because Belfield uh, was there and was regularly there and hadn't been picked up on the house to yeah. house inquiries. So uh, that, that, we knew that. It's interesting, Dave, and it's not sort of, you know, we're not seeing here going, oh, they should have done this, should have done that, but yeah. it just reinforces to me the importance of that early period, and we call it a canvas over here, door knock, whatever. Yeah. The And I, I in briefings, I couldn't stress it enough, the importance of getting the information that you need, and that's uh, that attention to detail is the type of thing that uh, yeah. cracks these cases open, isn't it? That's huge. It's huge, Gary. I mean... <laughs> It sounds like I'm being critical. I don't wish, wish to be because these colleagues of mine in Surrey Police would have, you know, we can't, we can't really now understand how huge this was. Yeah. And, um, you know, it would have been easy for that not to have been completed because of you've only got so many resources, so many members of staff. But, but the house to house is such a key area. When you're the officer, you know, at shop floor level, when yep. you're the detective and you're being asked to bang on doors and you're asked to go back numerous times because you can't get a reply and yeah. you think, oh, God, you know. You, you don't appreciate it. I, I know no. my young days as a detective and even you know, early days in homicide and I had uh, you know, people above me saying, no, go back. And I'm thinking, why are they back? Being so pedantic, and it's not until years down the track you yeah. realise exactly why they're being so pedantic. Because it is that you you ah. miss something, and people literally get away with murder, literally. And yeah. and and like you say, the attention to detail is that's what it's all about. Yeah. And it, and and with homicide, as you know, it's all about like as soon as possible. Let's get this in from. Let's get on with this CCTV. Let's get on with these house yeah. to house. Get that done early doors because that's where it is. That's where it's all about. It, it's it's fresh. It's in people's mm. minds for sure. Yeah. So you, you've got this uh, Levi. He's in custody. He's been charged with yeah the assaults on his partner. Mm. Um, you've got that. When did it get dropped on him, the murder charges? Um, it was about. Uh, about eighteen months later, I mean, he he was he was appearing at court numerous times before that. So he's still in custody. He was still in custody, and you guys were working on it, or the the teams were working on it, building the brief. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fairness, I, I was whisked away to do something else, um, but was dipping in and out. And in fact, do you know? From my side, it took so long to get this to court. Yeah. I actually ended up. Uh, leaving the team to go and work on counter-terrorism because the, 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 the tube bombings took place yeah, uh, and, and I'd completed the other homicide and got a verdict on that. So I decided, and these are <laughs> we might end up talking about these other things, but yeah. I had a little whisper that rotation was coming and I thought, well, <laughs> rather than get rotated onto another team, I'm going to pick where I go. So I went on counter-terrorism. Um, so I missed yeah. when it, in fairness, but, 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 it, it, it's it's in out there in the media. It was a huge, huge conviction for the Metropolitan Police. Oh, it's uh, yeah, a serial killer. And uh, did yeah. you find the working those that case? And I, I take on board what you say. You're in and out of it at different times. Yeah. But when you are working a serial killer case, you feel the responsibility that if you don't stop this person, other people might die. That's, that adds another dimension to a homicide investigation, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it's a huge responsibility. That is, it, individually, you, you, you kind of take on board. The media won't let you forget it. No yeah. one lets you forget the pressure, particularly with respect yep. uh, to, on, on the management team. Yes. Yeah. It, it, you can't, I mean, particularly with the British media. Oh, ruthless, absolutely ruthless, and yeah. and they decide who who they want you. They think they decide who they want you to arrest. But there was also that was tied up with some. Uh, I, uh, we got reports of it over here. The phone hacking on uh, was it on Millie Downer's family? Yeah, Something it was on the was family. There. That's right. Yeah. What, what happened there? Because it ah, uh... uh, it was it was huge at the time, and it was going on in all walks of life. It was going on with sports people. The, the hacking that was going on, um, and the family, the Dowler family particularly the father, he came under massive pressure from, from the media and, and everyone was saying, you know that finger pointing? Yeah. Uh, and I lived in that area, actually, and I knew of the family. I knew people who knew him. Yeah. And everyone was saying, oh, I think it's him. Everyone was saying, but it, it, they were all led by that. And then you had the phone hacking stuff. It was a nightmare for policing, absolute yeah. nightmare for policing. Um, not just in that 
in that murder, but it was going on so much yeah. that, you know, the media, would, they knew before we did yeah. about, so, or they had their that, own lines of inquiry they had running. The, the, the phones, access to the uh, yeah. conversations. So then they would, they were able to drive the inquiry in a certain way because they had information ahead of even what we did. And it would have had you all turning on each other who's leaking this information or uh, where this is coming from. It would have yeah, created yeah. Uh, chaos. So what, uh, Levi, convicted of the crimes? Convicted. Um, it's funny because I've done some TV work recently and, and, and there's discussions now around, around other unsolved crimes. Yeah. And, and Belfield has recently, from prison, been putting him putting himself up for, for other murders um, by talking to other villains within the prison. Th- and it, there is no evidence to suggest that he was. It, it's more about Levi Belfield loving the notoriety from prison. That's that's what it's I, – and I know I've gone into prisons where mm. people have been sprouting off or someone's told someone and – You've got to uh, cut through the bullshit because yeah. there is some bullshit there and they do like the attention and notoriety. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, uh, horrific crimes. He just uh, he deserves to rot in hell, I think, someone like that. Yeah, his life, his life means life. He's not, a, he's not got a life for 20 years, 25 years. Yeah. He's one of those that won't come out. Is there anything in his uh, – how old was he when uh, you guys started to focus in on him? Um, he would have been in his 30s, yeah. Is there anything in his background that uh, sort of indicated was there sexual assaults or anything? Again, with hindsight, there was you know when they look back at his life when he was at school and other things, you can you you can see that there's evidence there from his background that yeah, that it's going to go the wrong way. He wasn't right. right. Um, I had an interesting conversation with him. Um, we call it the caged area. It's where you want to smoke and all that. Yeah. And it's an area where you'd have normal conversation about, for example, he had a big tattoo of a to- of Tottenham on his on his calf muscle yeah. football team. So you, you we had good conversations and, and it, it was amazing, really. We got on really well. Uh, in fact, so well that he actually said to another officer, I like him, I'll speak to him, but I'm yeah. not going to speak to you. Because he, but that's not because I'm a superstar. That's because you, you naturally sometimes, some guys don't, don't yeah, click. Other guys do, you know. And, and I, I think it. that's uh, you move the parts around. Like I've, I've gone into a yeah. room and someone's taken an interest, dis, in, um, instant dislike. Yeah. So you put someone else in there, and just yeah. and, until you get that uh, get that rapport. Did you get a sense? And I, I've uh, you know I've spoken to uh, serial killers, interviewed serial killers, and some project this. There's something dark behind them. Did you, like you said, you could get on with him and communicate? They've got on on yeah. the surface, but there is it. Was there something that uh, stuck out to, with uh, oh, 100%, Belfield? Hundred percent. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the conversation I had was, listen, I actually remember saying to him, listen, I want to help you, mm. but you need to understand. You need to help yourself. You need to understand that what you did doesn't make you a bad person. What that means was there's something not right. Yeah, there's something not right with you. That we we need to consider and get you some 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 help. Which, if you if you if you think about it, there's clearly something not right with these people. They're not wired right, yeah. are they? I mean, so that's right. But it's getting that through to them to them for them to accept that. It's like any other person who's got narcissistic behaviour, for example. They will never accept that they're narcissistic. But you can see it from the outside. But if you can persuade them to understand that, you can persuade them to get help. And and he said to me, he replied, he said, so. He looked me right in the eye and he said, "So, despite everything I've done, you, you, you'd still help me. You'd still." And I said, "Yeah, yeah, I want to help you." Yeah. Listen, I, 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 I'm, I'm telling you, there's something not right with you, and I'm telling you, I know what you're responsible for. You just need to face that and 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 come out there and discuss that, whatever that is. And you could see he was, but it wasn't. You know, we didn't fall out over that. Yeah, I saw it hit home. I, I like that approach, and and people often think what goes on in the interview room. They think it's I know you've done it, and there's you know, <laughs> it'll get not, you nowhere. Yeah. yeah, it gets you nowhere. You've got to talk to the person yeah. and unravel what's going on in in there. Absolutely, you do. Yeah, and yeah. and you see, you see in the body language, you know when you've got through to them. There's something that you just see in their eyes, or, yeah. or something the way they react, and hold oh, it. They're actually listening to me. Yeah, um, does doesn't work all the time. I'm uh, I'm fascinated by the fact that you can keep them there for. Uh, a week, mm. a, a 
person of interest. I'm sure there's checks and balances. You've got custody managers all and, the time, and so yeah. checking on their welfare. So it's not a matter of seven days of uh, sustained torture. It used to be back in the day. <laughs> well, <laughs> that didn't go well at times. No, well, there, there's been a few uh, <laughs> few ones that have uh, blown up, blown back, hasn't, hasn't yeah. there? A few well known ones, but uh, no. I mean, the senior officer would have to go to court uh, and get a warrant for further yep. detention. And it's same with counter terrorism. The counter terrorism act slightly different. Yeah. So uh, it, it's different hours of the test. It's effectively the same, though. So there's there's measures all the way. And then, obviously, while they're in detention, they still still need sleep periods, yeah. food, drink, and all that. So you're still limited. It's quite a narrow time of actually interviewing. Yeah. We're, we're the same. We have uh, downtime if we're waiting on the solicitor or you know, mm. they, they've got to have sleep time out, that type, type of thing. Mm. But... Uh, and you need the protections. I, I haven't, even as a cool. police officer, of course, I'd, I'd want to be able to stay in there for 10 days if, if you know, thought you yeah. were getting through. But I can understand the need for the uh, the checks and balances. But uh, I like your approach to it, the the way that you in, um, mm. approach, approach the interviews. <laughs> Looking back at the Belfield investigation and, uh, yeah, it's... In a uh, police officer's career, uh, well, I, I know in this country, it's fairly rare that you work on a, a serial killer um, mm. and the pressures of working on serial serial killers, they're becoming a little bit more prevalent. I think that's probably because we're the way that we're policing that we might be discovered more. Did you learn anything from that investigation, being involved in an investigation of that magnitude? Yeah, I, I think, we, I mean, we've touched on it um, earlier and that <clears throat> all the telltale signs of Belfield's behaviour and his propensity of violence, et cetera, et cetera, were all there, all that, all there at a young age. Yep. Um, if I'm honest, those those crimes of abuse, whether it be mistreatment of animals, it usually starts there. Petty theft, threat, threatening behaviour, assaults, everything, mm. all that's there for the investigator at the beginning. But the pressures are there, the lack of resources. I, I'm not sure how we're ever going to change it. Yeah. I, I, I think it was better back in the day when I was a young detective. I think we had, I think we had more of a hold. I think so much is lost by these squads that are set up who specialise in certain things as opposed to the all rounder detective on a on a CID team who yeah. would know his he'd know his area and he would know. So you had the old fashioned collator who used to have all the evidence from all all the uniform cops used to put it in. Uh Levi Belfield scene knocking around yeah, with so and so. Intel collator. Yeah, he would he would have it all. And it used to be in a card system, then it would be on computer. And we, the detectives on the on the division or on the borough as we called it, would 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 have a feel for all these characters. Yeah. We knew who all the burglars were. And then all of a sudden someone reinvented the wheel and said, we're not going to do that. We're going to have specialists. So you you can be a detective yeah. working on burglary squad. You can be a detective working on rape. You call that, we'll give that a name. We'll call that Sapphire. Domestic violence. There's not much left for a detective to do, by the way, because yeah. there's all these different squads. So what you've got then is you've got this void of other crime, so-called petty crime, theft of motorcycles, bikes, cars, all that sort of stuff, that that doesn't really get investigated at all. And you've got these uniform cops who don't really want to be detectives, yeah. but they're forced into that arena because no one else is – we haven't got the resources to do that anymore. So actually, as a uniform cop, you're going to do that. We call that beat crimes. Yeah. Beat crimes because that's kind of small stuff. Who are we going to get? I know what we'll do. We'll get these officers back out of serious crime on rotation and we'll put that sergeant in charge of that team of budding detectives. So you destroy the sergeant and his yeah. world and he's not motivated. You've got these young cops who don't want to be doing it. They're not motivated mm. and they've got no hold over who all these villains are because it's all divvied up into different areas. And... Back in the day, we're all in a CID office, all of us detectives, all the old guys, all the young guys. Yeah. If you were rotated back to that, you wouldn't mind so much because you were still dealing with major crime yes. and you were still amongst well, you, your own. You, you could you could do your murder one day, you'd do an armed robbery the next oh. day. And yeah. you come in, you fight. You'd fight over that. I, well, I want to do that. Yeah. Well, you said that's a kidnap. I want that kidnap. Well, you had a kidnap last week. I want to do that. Well, you, do, you described our old divisional detective's office where you, you'd have three- 
yeah, experienced detective sergeants. You might have a lazy one and uh, yeah. a, a real go getter and then a smart one. It was a good combination. And yeah, then the constables would be hanging off. I want to work with this one. And yeah. And, and, and it works. And I know I've gone slightly off on a tangent to yeah. your question, but your question is would have been easily answered because. In that CID team, we would yeah. we would have known Belfield inside out. Yes, yeah, and we would have known. So when all of a sudden they got this thing going on, we'd say, "I know a guy, Levi Belfield. He's been seen. The collator would know. You would know because you'd, you'd have nicked him for bullying someone with his car clamping. You'd have nicked yeah. him uh, because he was." Driving past the bus stop, I mean, this actually happened. He drove past the bus stop a few days before the murder of Amélie de Lagrange, approached, literally, approached some people, uh, uh, some young women, and started chatting them up. And, you know, that's yeah, it. That was his forte. In fact, the surveillance team, after, before we went nicking him, the surveillance team followed him actually doing that as well. Right. Okay. But we would have been made aware of that. Jobs like that, they uh, yeah, they leave a mark on you. How have you felt uh, felt from that, look, looking back at that job? Do you know... Um, if I'm honest, the funny thing is that during my period throughout the police, and there's been numerous homicides, I've, I, I, it didn't feel at the time it left its mark. But since I've retired yeah. and I've been doing some interviews and stuff on TV, and then you don't generally talk about it with wives and partners and, and friends unless they ask. You know, yeah. you know, it's a bit like that. You don't, yeah, let me tell you a story, Bell. I mean, you and I would talk about a few war stories, yeah. so to speak, but. But when I was talking um, recently on television about a particular homicide, I could feel myself getting emotional. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You, have you felt that? I uh, Look, Dave, I'm, I'm meant to be doing this interview, but <laughs> yes, I, I know what you're talking about. And I've tried to reconcile it in, in my mind that uh, when you're doing the job, you're so focused on it, you yeah. haven't even got time to reflect on the, the trauma, the tragedy, yeah. the emotion of it. Yeah. And then when you step away, yeah. I think sometimes I'm looking back at jobs and I get more of an emotional reaction now than what I did back then. Yeah. But I think that's because you're focused on it. Now, we've probably got psychologists <laughs> listening to us and they'll drag us drag us out of here. But yeah. I think that's the nature of uh, being a homicide detective. You can't afford to lose it emotionally while you're on, on the case. No, and I never did. Yeah. But, but, but I'll be perfectly honest, talking here and now, thereafter, I, I have since. Yeah, and the other thing is that when people, uh, what I've noticed for me, and it might just be me, um, people talk to you and they and they ask you these questions, particularly in the television stuff I've been doing, and then they'll say something nice about, "Listen, you've must you've done a fantastic job. You must have seen some stuff, and I can only imagine what it was like, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Yeah, right. yeah, and that makes me a little bit emotional because that makes the that I've never considered that. Yeah, I just did my job. But but maybe I'm just becoming that emotional. Well, God, maybe it's an age <laughs> thing. I don't know. But I no, I I know what you're saying. So I I understand what you're saying because it mm. makes you think. Well, you didn't give it much of a second thought, and yeah, I reconciled it in my mind that it wasn't. I lacked emotion. I wasn't a robot the way I went about my work. But mm. the work was the focus, and that was. So yeah. you just had to keep moving, had to keep taking that step forward and, and going on it. But yeah, when you look back, you realise. I think you <clears> you see world. The world a little bit more normal when you step out of it, yeah. And you probably look back and you can see, oh, that was that was a lot of trauma there and that type yeah. of thing. Yeah, but yeah. I, yeah. At least I, th I think it's important. At least you're acknowledging it. Yeah, look, that's how, how you're feeling. I think that's probably probably good talking on that. Oh, I mean, oh, they thought. I, I listen. I, mm. I had a heart attack about two years ago, right? Yep. Um, during COVID. Yeah, there was a lot of stress leading up to that in the in in the in the work I was doing at that stage. But I think it was more of a hereditary problem than mm. stress work related. But they they did a bit of work around me, and they thought I might be suffering from PTSD. Yeah, I wasn't. Yeah, uh, through having some therapy that was organised. But um, what they what they did say was that effectively, after thirty five years of police in the Metropolitan Police, that effectively you're burnt out, basically. Yeah. You, you need you need you need now to consider what your options are. But I wasn't burnt out with helping the public and doing my job. I was burnt out with the politics and the bureaucracy and the frustration. A whole different ball game. But but it's clear to me now, having stepped away, that that emotion. The, I can. I, I'm very proud of what I've done. Yeah. But when people you know tell me that, and I, even now I can feel it. I can feel that emotion. So yeah, you know that that we did. You know we. 
the police service did a great job and I'm part of that and always always will be pleased that I did. But Yeah, well, I I had 34 years in and I understand what you're saying and it, you you get to the point where it's at that limit and how much can yeah. you, you go and probably you go past the point where you do too much damage and that might be where the uh, PTSD kicks, uh, kicks in. But uh, mm. yeah, and you, you're stepping away from, I think, when you're in the job, You've got such a purpose in life. You know, when we're talking about um, yeah. when you left the police, well, what do I do now? I used to get up every morning and yeah. I knew I had something worthwhile, counter-terrorism, homicide or whatever, mm. all very worthwhile things to uh, to follow. We've got ahead of ourselves. It sounds like it, it could be the end of the podcast. Okay, well, all the best for the future, <laughs> but we haven't even started why you joined the police. Why did you join the police? Uh, yeah, I mean, I always, as a young lad growing up, listen, you can tell by my kind of, London Cockney accent that I I was born I was born and brought up in the middle of London in Westminster yep. which sounds terribly posh but it wasn't it was a great big council estate and it was a working class area and I had good parents I always knew right from wrong but I, you know I grew up with some with some <laughs> some interesting characters and went to school there but I always had this feeling I wanted to join the police but my schooling was appalling. Yep, I was just a victim of the comprehensive system at the time, and so you know that had been the early seventies, and um, I, I left school with no real exams, and thought, you know, I want to be a policeman. So I went, to, I went to up for interview, and I put put down, filled all the forms out. I had a cousin who was married to a police officer, and and I went to see him, and it just made me really interested. There was programs on the TV, which I don't know you've seen over here. You know, have you ever seen the Sweeney over here? Which oh, was a, yeah, yeah. love the Sweeney. The Sweeney was just yeah. that was the. I mean, you and I were the same age, I think. Yeah, yeah. So the Sweeney was like the be all and end all to me. So I wanted to be part of the Sweeney. You know, you you can forgive a young fella aged eighteen, nineteen wanting that. So, so there I was. I went through the interview stages, and um. I got through to the last bit. So this is 1981 and I was 19 yep. and I got through to the last stages and they, I had to fill this. I never, they put this form in front of me and yep. said, can you fill that form out? And it's like, have you ever had a juvenile caution? And if I'm honest, I'd had one of those forms put in front of me before and I just ignored it. <laughs> and I thought, ah, I overthought it. I thought they're trying to catch me out here. Yeah? Yeah. And I had a juvenile caution and right. it sounds terrible for stealing a motorbike. And, and I didn't steal a motorbike, but, there was a, there was a, it was stealing by finding. There was a mo a motorcycle. It was a, more of a, a pooch thing. It was like a uh, moped. And it, I lived by the river. So is that your defence? I didn't steal a motorbike. I didn't it was steal a moped. It. I didn't steal it. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we kind of went scrambling on it down the River Thames. Right. So imagine the scene in London. You got the River Thames, like, and there's these, these, these three kids taking it in turns, scrambling up and down the river. Yeah. However, one day. My mate, who was a bit of a rascal, said, look, you know, I, I actually needed to go to the dentist. Um, I won't tell you why, but it involved a bit of a scuffle at school. So I had to go to the dentist. <laughs> and he said, I'll give you a lift on the moped. <laughs> so we, we ended up on the street, on the road. Me sat on the back of this moped and him driving it with crash helmets. But where we were. A couple of missing teeth. Yeah, with a couple of missing teeth on the way to the dentist. And uh, the guy who owned the moped saw the moped oh no and we were stopped at a level crossing and he came up and said that's my motorbike that's my moped best you boys get off and at that point I just did as I was told because he was bigger than me and older than me so I just <laughs> yeah. anyway we ended up at the police station my mum and my dad was called down it was a it was a moment I'll never forget but I was I was good at school in as much as I was a school sports captain I was in the football team I represented the area yep. I'd been scouted for professional teams by trials so I was good that way I was just hopeless <laughs> at maths and English <laughs> because, yeah the academics but my experience wasn't the greatest with the police but I I just fancied joining the cops so I filled this form out and I put yeah I had I had, had a juvenile caution and then that changed everything because I had the interview then yeah and they said things, you know, like, why do you want to be a police officer? And I, you know, I was young and stupid. So I said things like, you know, I'd watch the Sweeney on the TV. And I yeah, oh, that's a great be, answer. Yeah. yeah. We'll I wanted, to be, I wanted to be just, just like the guys on the Sweeney. <laughs> um, obviously didn't go down well. But but the problem was, more importantly, was the, um, the juvenile caution. So they sent me away and said, listen, I'm sorry you failed. So uh, I tried again another year or two later. And everything happens for a reason because I, I, I became an electrician. 
Um, <laughs> so did I. You're an electrician. Yeah. <laughs> That's the bright sparks. Yeah. Um, so I um, did an apprenticeship and I got a great job. I got a great job, more by luck than judgment. I got a great job at the BBC, so I went into BBC television. Yeah. Arrived on the studio floor doing television lighting. I thought, hang on, I'd arrived, you know. So the police cool. kind of took a back, back step. I was working on Top of the Pops and all these big mm-hmm. Only Fools and Horses and all these BBC productions, and I was happy. Until we went on strike, and the whole the whole country at the time was a minor strike. It was a lot of yeah, trouble. A- and then I wandered in. I was on strike, and I should have been on a picket line. Yeah trying to persuade other electricians not to cross the picket line. But that wasn't really my bag. So I just wandered off and ended up at the careers office at Scotland Yard. And I went in there and they said, ah, oh, yeah, how many O-levels or GCSEs have you got? And I went, mm, none. Um, Why do you want to join the police? Gave my reasons. Right, we're going to have to take a, an exam. I took the exam, passed. I think now that they recognise it takes it takes a thief to catch a thief. I'm not sure. But they recognise something in me. Yeah. They probably thought, and at that time, if I'm being honest, I, I got a job. I passed the exam, so I wasn't stupid. Yeah. I passed the exam. I, uh, I, I ended up at did, uh, training school and did really well because I really believed in it, wanted to do well, and I was really – and um, curiously, they used to pick me for all the stooge roles, you know, like the market trader or the yeah. the villain of the piece. And, you know, you know, Dave, you're going to be that bloke. But I was streetwise and I knew my way around London and I knew a villain. I knew what they were and I knew who they were. But I wasn't – I didn't have the exams and it, it's a bit different now. But that, that but life experience, I think, counts prices. for so, so much because yeah. if you if you go in too early without life experience your whole world is shaped by yeah. what you learn as a police officer when you've you've had that life outside the uh, mm. cops i think it helps it helps a great deal uh, you know with hindsight i'd say to any young person who didn't get in the police listen don't let that don't let that get you down don't let that worry you go on and do something else keep that on the back burner and revisit it yeah. Because that life experience that I learned, oh, it was absolutely priceless and it paid dividends in my policing world later. It gave me that famous gut feeling. I already had that. Yeah. Um, well, street smarts. It's, yeah. You, you need that. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that's, you know, it's not the only part of it, but you need that to, uh, you know, complement being a fully rounded uh, police officer. Yeah. And I I turned up at training school and I, I, I went through it. It was a bit... I just went through. It was a dream for me. I just, I loved every minute of the training school. I, uh, I, I found uh, with the, at the academy, we call it rather than training school, but uh, I found the moment I went there, I thought, yep, yeah, this is the right fit. It just felt right. Policing felt, yeah. felt right. So you get out of the uh, training school and then uh, uniform. Yeah. I get out of training school and um, I arrived at, I wanted to go into London because that's where I came from, but, but, <laughs> I was good at football and yep. I was visited at the training school by a guy who persuaded me to go to f- what he called five area. <laughs> he said, I want you on my team. And he was in charge of the of the football, football being soccer to you guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was persuaded to say, yeah, okay, I'll come and play football. And I went on to play for the Metropolitan Police, which is kind of semi-professional. Yeah. Um, amongst other teams that I played for, which was great, but I also played for the area and for this guy. He just he just had a way about him. He was a good bloke, and we look after you. And and, and a he lot did. of policing careers were shaped in New South Wales. It wasn't uh, soccer was the, the game; it was rugby league. But if you're a good rugby league player, yeah, there was a, and a boss was in the rugby league, yeah. you, you would find yourself at that uh, that station. It's incredible, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. So, so <laughs> I I went to a place called Kingston, which was quite posh really but it had a massive drug problem in as much as there was the what, what was called the kaleidoscope project which was a, a, a heroin addiction center where they used to turn up these guys or uh, and, and, and women would turn up and get their methadone which was yeah. that heroin substitute but of course that's where the drug dealers went yeah so the first i mean i mean i was in only in uniform a short period of time and uh, you're aware of Cressida dick who was the police commissioner in London until fairly recently, a female. She right. was the police commissioner um, up until uh, last year. Okay. Well, she was my reporting sergeant yep. and she said to me, she was quite terribly, terribly, David, whatever you do, you have to be a detective. Because I'd already showed 
you know, that that's what I wanted to do. I yeah. wanted to investigate. And the, the guys in uniform do a fantastic job. And it's horses for courses. I'm not taking anything away from them. Yeah. I wasn't better than them. That was just the attrib Dif attributes I had. Yeah. Direction. So I then went an attachment to the CID and then um and I was put on the burglary squad. And that's where I that's where I started to shine a bit. And that was uh like a training ground for detectives, like the yeah. burglary squad. I think the burglary squad, and I don't think they do it the same anymore like that. They, they, they The burglaries yeah. now tend to be reported over the phone, and if you're the victim, you get a crime number and you claim off the insurance. It's a huge mistake in many ways. I think what we lose with not investigating um, the minor crimes yeah. is that the bigger crimes come from the minor crimes, and oh, I, yeah. I can reference one, and it, it taught me a lot, school tuck shop broken into it could have been solved if any. It was reported to the police. It could have been solved if anyone investigated. It was pretty easy. Mm. Got broken into again. Then a the house got broken into. At the house, a gun was found. The kids took the gun. Oh. Then they did a robbery, all of which, all these different offences, if they were investigated properly, could have been solved. Then they've done a robbery and killed someone yeah. wa walking home. And it was yeah. just, it, it taught me a lesson that you got to jump on these early crimes yeah. and you can... Pr potentially prevent the uh, bigger crime. So if they're just self-reporting, and yeah, that's people come in the police station and, oh, you don't report here at the police station, you phone this number. That's right. Like, it doesn't give you a lot of confidence. No, and I just think it's a, a great sort of almost a great training place for, for yeah. a young person to be, to, to want, who wanted to be a detective to learn the skills and I don't I mean I've got, I've got a quick story if I if yeah, I, yeah there's no rush with time with, I, I, you're, you're the one on holidays <laughs> you can't yeah, say you've got to go to work it's cloudy today <laughs> yeah, yeah we wouldn't have, I'd just shout out if it was a sunny day it wasn't coming <laughs> I'll be yeah. swimming in Bondi yeah. um yeah, um, so so there I was at this burglary squad, and I was suited up, and I I went to uh, so the crime had been reported. We would then follow it up. So I've knocked on the door, wanted to speak to the victim, and it was a house divided into flats. So I've knocked on the door, and a guy who answered the door wasn't the victim. He was from Europe, and I couldn't work out where he was from, but he had an yeah. accent, and he could be, you know. Uh, I just, there was something about him that I didn't quite take to, but he let me in. He was more curious about me than I was about him, strangely. But I just ignored that. And I went and then knocked on the inner door, spoke to the victim. And and she said, listen, I've had stuff go missing all the time. I don't know how. I don't know how they are, they are getting in. But it's missing. It's jewellery. It's cash. It's small stuff. I said, right, okay. I said, no chance of a key, explored all the possibilities, checked the windows, nothing, nothing, nothing. I said, what? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go and knock on the other flats, see if there's anything. So I knocked on the other flats, and this fella, this young fella answered the door. Didn't speak very good English. Still didn't like him, but his girlfriend was there. But she was asleep. She was an aero stash. She came to the door, and I spoke to her. And she explained that the boyfriend was a painter and decorator, and that he was there during the day, and she spoke to him. And asked him a few questions on my behalf, and he hadn't seen or heard anything. Yeah. But I didn't like him. There's something about him? Something about him I didn't like. And then I went, knocked on the other doors, and then I went back. And as I went back down the stairs to the, the ground floor one, I saw this great big window in the hallway, which just allowed light in. That was all it did. Yeah. But it was a fixed pane. Yeah. Been a bit of a tradesman, been an electrician, slightly different trade, I know, but I could see that the beading that was holding the glass window in, I could see damage to the paintwork and it had been prized up. Yeah. So we have or had scenes of crimes officers, which were probably what you guys yeah, have, civilian investigators, yeah, forensics. Civilians that come in and do the crime scene examination. Fingerprints. Yeah. Yeah. So- I get on the uh, get on the radio as it was then because we just carry radio. It wasn't mobile phones. I got on the radio and just asked for the soco to come down. Seen the crimes officer, and he turned up, and we got a pair of steps up, and you could see the whole of the beading had been removed. And then the most beautiful thing I've ever seen was a set where he lifted, put screwdriver underneath the glass. It was that wired glass, yeah, and he lifted it up and then he'd it let it sit in both hands. Lovely set of prints. So on the inside was all those fingerprints, all the four fingers. Yeah. And on the other side was a perfect thumbprint. Perfect. And it to me at my stage of my young career, that was like it I mean it didn't end there because it got a bit got a bit awkward thereafter. But that that taught me a lot. But so 
off I go with the scenes crimes officer and I get this guy, then go back to this girl at some stage, get all these details, routine, just want to check a few things via Interpol. I didn't know who Interpol was at that stage, but I, this is where you go to the, the, the guys who've got all the experience and this yeah. is what you need to do, get on in the poll. From Tenerife, this character got all his previous convictions and there were lots, car thief, right, so. et cetera, et cetera. Matched it with the fingerprints, jobs are good. And, and which I then get the fingerprint docket. I then interview him and I give him a chance to explain why his prints were there. I don't disclose the fact I, I yeah. don't disclose the fact that I've I've got his fingerprints. I'll yeah. give him a chance to explain it. He doesn't explain Have it. Have you ever touched this window? Have you ever, yeah, yeah, give him all that. Um, and he doesn't explain it, so he gets charged. The, the interesting thing was, and it taught me a lot, was that the girlfriend went berserk. She actually accused me of planting the fingerprints. <laughs> I mean, it was, the, it was the best set of fingerprints I've ever had in my career. But You can't predict it. So we went to court, and this is the, the way it was at the time. It was just starting to swing. So as a detective, you didn't get, you didn't get um, he's a police officer, let's trust him. I can't get it. But I, I was in the box for ages being accused of a liar and being accused of planting the fingerprints. Yeah. Which hurt. Oh, that's, I, yeah, and that's the price you pay being a detective, the amount of time you sit in the witness box getting uh, yeah, criticised. Yeah. I've said to young detectives, because a lot of people are risk adverse and they don't want conflict, and I've said, guys, it doesn't matter what you do. When you mm -hmm. get in the witness box, you're going to be accused of this, accused of, of that, and it's just part and parcel of, uh, yeah. Being, being a detective, yeah. I see the excitement on your face just talking about that job as an early one, and they're, they're the type of jobs, and I've got jobs yeah. like that that just go, wow, and I get paid for this. <laughs> it's almost it's, like it's too good to be true, isn't it? It was the greatest feeling. Yeah, it was. The, so picture this young lad wanting to join the police. He solved this all on his own. It was all him with the help of the yeah. scenes of crime officer. Yeah. Took it to court, gave evidence. It was everything I wanted. Yeah, and everything I went on to do, but it it was just me, and it felt so good. And how much do you learn by those little stepping stones? Oh, we've we've got over here; they're rushing people into major crime to fill spots in major crime, and I think you, lo yeah. you you lose out so much with getting those little victories where you've taken it right from the start, seen yeah. it all the way through court, and it just helps you so much when you work the, the bigger cases. Yeah. So, okay, the bigger cases. Yeah, so there, there's. I, I wanted to. Oh, well, first of all, um, how did you find your way into uh, the murder squad? Yeah, so I was. If you, if you think about it at the time, I was kind of a trainee detective, and then yeah. during the mid nineties, there was a big bottleneck of like like kindred spirits like me, all of similar backgrounds, strangely, working class kids. Um, all streetwise, all good cops, all wanting to be detectives. And it was a bottleneck. And eventually, after about five years of being a trainee detective, yeah. I think it was about 96, 97, I, and I worked and I did rapes, kidnaps. I was all that as a trainee detective yeah. alongside skilled, experienced yeah. ones. Then I got my detective. That's a desig, we call it Desi a designated detective. Yeah. Yep. And then you, you know, you kind of move or you get a choice to move. And I moved to Hammersmith, which was inner city. Right. So I went to Inner City and it was fantastic and there was some great stuff and we had I did surveillance. We had a thing called a Q car and it would be a driver, experienced detectives, and we would wander around the streets of Shepherds Bush and Hammersmith using that, you know, gut feeling and that street, you know, and you would identify thieves, robbers, also it was great, it was fantastic. And then I, I was contacted in ninety eight and approached if I wanted to go on a what we used to call a uh, we used to call it a murder team and it was the AMIT which was the Area Major Investigation Team and this changed so many times over the years it was a murder team and then it went from AMIT to AMIP and then it went from AMIP to SCD which was the Specialist Crime Directorate. Yeah, Dave, we what, you've got, to, what you've got to appreciate is every time it changed, someone got a promotion. So <laughs> <laughs> you, you've got to understand that was... Someone reinvented the wheel. Yeah. Eh? All right. Look, we might uh, take a break uh, now. And uh, when we uh, get back, I think we're going to talk about uh, your counterterrorism because... Uh, and we'll take the conversation wherever it goes because I'm finding it fascinating uh, sitting here talking to you. And we haven't even covered the electrical work that we did as apprentices <laughs> yet. <laughs> we might do that at the end. Yeah, yeah. I look forward to <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll have a break and back shortly.